I'm Angela Berger. Welcome to my channel. I cover true crime and missing person cases. So today's case is going to take us all the way back to the 1970s to a case that, you know, yet has to be solved. It has not been solved yet. Um, so 15-year-old Mary Rager, it was 1974, and like many other girls in the 1970s, she kept a diary. However, in the very last diary entry she ever wrote, she said, To my family, should I die, I ask that my stuffed animals go to my sister. If I am murdered, find my killer and see that justice is done. I have a few reasons to fear for my life, and what I ask is important. So Mary Rieger wrote this diary entry, and then... Just days later, 15-year-old Mary Raker and her 12-year-old sister, Suzanne Raker, were murdered, stabbed to death in St. Cloud, Minnesota. So did Mary know that she was to be killed? Was she being threatened? Let's get into the mystery and find out. Mary and Suzanne were born to Fred and Rita Raker. Altogether, the Rakers had six children. They had four girls and two boys. Fred worked at Liturgical Press in Collegeville. The family, they were all devout Catholics and they attended church regularly. Mary was a normal 15 year old girl. She really enjoyed baking and playing foosball. She went to St. Francis High School in Little Falls, Minnesota. She was a sophomore there. And, you know, she was a little bit rebellious, but she wasn't a bad kid. You know, sometimes she would go out and hang out with boys and smoke cigarettes without her parents knowing. But, you know, she didn't really get into too much trouble. Her family, like I said before, they were devout Catholics, very straight-laced. So sometimes she would like to use bad language to shock them. Um, Mary was pretty outgoing and, you know, she liked to have fun. And then her sister, Susanna, was, or sorry, Suzanne was three years younger. And Suzanne was very quiet, shy, um, reserved girl, but she was also very loyal to her siblings and especially her sister, Mary. Uh, the girls were very close. September 2nd, 1974 started like any um, other day. It was Labor Day. And the girls got up around 10 o'clock in the morning. Mary said that she needed to go to the store. She needed to get a couple things for a geometry class, a protractor, and a compass. So her sister, Suzanne, said that she would go uh, with Mary. Around 11, 10, the girls set out. And they had to walk about a mile down mostly the residential street that they lived on to go to Zaire's department store. And then around noon, the manager at a store called Shopco saw them come in, and this store was on the way to Zaire. So they just decided to stop in there quickly on their way to Zaire's. The manager knew who they were because they would frequently come in and shop in the store. Um, then after that, at about noon, one of their neighbors named Jacob Younger he reported seeing the girls at Zayers, and they stopped and talked with him for a couple minutes. Then, as the girls were walking away, he heard Suzanne say something like, um, let's not, I don't like that man, or I don't like that man, I don't want to go with him. He wasn't sure of the exact word. When Jacob left the store, he saw this man in a blue Chevy waiting outside and he thought the man looked nervous. When he saw him, he immediately thought about what he had heard Suzanne say about not wanting to go um, with a man. And he, I don't know, immediately he just made this connection. The next sighting of Suzanne and Mary was at about 2 p.m. A man was in the Briggs Lake Tavern and he saw the two girls come in. He knew it was them because one of the girls was wearing a jacket that had their last name Raker on it. He said that the girls were with two men, one that was tall and one that was um, shorter. He said that Mary was 
very animated talking with the guy. She looked like she was having fun. And then Suzanne was there. She wasn't talking to anybody. She just looked very uncomfortable. The man also said that after they came in, there were about 10 um, young people that came in after them, like teenagers. He said that they went into another room to play foosball. And a while later, he looked in the room and everyone um, had left. Now, even though this man reported seeing the girls in this tavern, you know, there were at least two dozen other people in the tavern that day, and none of them came forward to say they had also seen the girls. Um, it could be because a lot of them were younger people and they didn't want to get in trouble for being in this tavern, but it is just a little weird that out of all the people there, absolutely no one came forward um, to say that they had seen the girls there. And then shortly after that time, there was another man who saw the two girls. They were walking by themselves. He remembered because they had been, they were walking past his tool shed and he kept a really close eye on them because the tool shed was locked and he was afraid that they might um, steal something. And at that point, they were walking toward this quarry. A woman who lived across from Meridian Quarry Aggregates said that she saw the two girls walking towards the quarry with a tall man. Now, Meridian Quarry Aggregates, this was a place outside of town. It was no longer used anymore. And the quarry was filled with water. So it was a really popular place for people to go swimming on nice days. It was also kind of, you know, there was a lot of litter there, food wrappers, pop and beer cans, even some clothing. Um, so this was where teenagers would hang out. And it was common on a nice day for there to be like dozens of cars parked along the quarry. So this particular day, it was September 2nd. And it was very warm and sunny, so I would imagine there were probably a lot of people there that day. The girls' parents were expecting them to be back around 4 o'clock that evening. Um, they were supposed to, or Mary was supposed to get picked up by a carpool um, to do something with her school. And originally, she had thought that was going to be at 4 o'clock. Um, so she you know, had said she would be back by that time. By the time... Five o'clock came around. Rita and Fred started to get worried. Um, six o'clock, they knew something was wrong because the girls were always punctual. You know, if they said they were going to be home at a certain time, they would be home at that time. And if they were going to be late, they would always call um, to let their parents know. So they were very responsible. And then at 7.15, you know, after reaching out to see if any of their friends knew they were where they were, at this point, the parents reported the girls missing to the authorities. Unfortunately, law enforcement didn't take the case too seriously at first. You know, that's often the case when teenagers go missing. Law enforcement just assumed that they were runaways and that they would be back soon. So, two days after the girls went missing, the family started getting weird phone calls. The person would call, the family would pick up, they would wait a couple minutes, and then just hang up. Two days after the phone calls, and 24 days after Mary and Suzanne were mi went missing, two, two teenage boys were in the Meridian Quarry aggregates when they came across the badly decomposed body of 12-year-old Suzanne. Suzanne had been stabbed in the left side approximately 12 times. The boys called the authorities. The authorities came out to the quarry. They searched the water. It was 40 feet of water. And around 6 p.m., they pulled the lifeless body of 15-year-old Mary Raker from the quarry. Um, she had also been stabbed um, in the left side of her abdomen um, a few more times than Suzanne had, and Mary's body was better preserved um, because she had been in the water. When Suzanne was found, she was laying face down. 
um, and her sweater had been, like, she was fully clothed, except her sweater had been pulled up to her wrist, as if she had been drugged by the wrist to the spot where she was laying. Mary had been stabbed several times, also in the left side of the stomach, like Suzanne, and then after that, her body was thrown off the 50-foot ledge into the water of the quarry. Um, her bra had been cut, and there was also a four to six inch strip of material that was cut out of her sweater and her sweater had been pulled up over um, her head her underwear and her pants were found um, like hanging on the ledge like on the cliff um, which was above where she had been in the water one of mary's shoes was on and the other was found in the water she still had her wristwatch on and the watch had stopped at 325 so we're thinking that's about the time that she had been thrown into the water which caused the watch to stop on september 15th so this was you know several days before the girls had been found there were some college students who were hanging out at the quarry and they had seen the clothing on the ledge the cliff ledge so they had taken pictures of it but they didn't report it to authorities and they also had not seen Suzanne's body, or at least nobody reported having seen it. And then two days after the girls were found, their parents started getting those weird phone calls again where the person would call, and then after someone answered, they would hang up. Now, police tried to track these calls, but the caller always hung up before they were able to trace it. Susan and Mary's parents, they were relentless in their search for the killer, and they also wanted to help other families, other parents who had been through um, similar things. Um, so they opened or they started the Central Minnesota chapter of Parents of Murdered Children. And that was to, to support families who had lost children. Rita was also one of the founding members of the Tri-County Crime Stoppers of Minnesota. So now we're going to look into... Um, a couple of the potential suspects in this case. A woman named Georgianne Dreher came forward to say that just days before the girls went missing, she had been sexually assaulted by a man um, actually at the quarry, the same location where the girls' bodies had been found. She said that she was near the Zaire Shopping Center and she saw this man um, riding his bike across the street. She was new to the area, um, so she didn't really have a lot of friends, and she was interested in meeting people, so whenever he came by, she started talking to him. Um, he said that his name was Lloyd, and that he was a carnival worker, so he would travel with the carnival to different cities um, and work, and then when the carnival would move to a different city, um, he would move with it. And Lloyd was about 18 years old. So it was a hot day and end of August. So Georgianne asked if there were any local swimming places. And he said, yeah, and told her about the quarry. So they rode their bikes over to the quarry. And then when they got there, his mood suddenly changed. And he pulled out a knife and basically told her to do, you know, whatever he wanted or he would kill her. Lloyd sliced up her pants with a knife and then he sexually assaulted her. Um, shortly after that, a car like, pulled up above them. And at that point, Georgianne was able to get away. Um, but who knows what would have happened to her if that car hadn't come. Um, she said at the time she did tell the authorities um, but they were never able to find out who this man was. And they also said that they didn't think that it was related to the Raker sisters' murder. Because they had somebody else in mind, which we'll get to in just a bit. Then in 1975, it was March of 1975, um, two sisters went missing from just outside of Washington, D.C., um, they were 12-year-old Sheila and 10-year-old Catherine Lyon. Um, authorities released a mugshot 
of the man they felt was responsible and as soon as Georgianne saw this picture, she realized that that was the man that had raped her at the quarry. Uh, it was Lloyd Welch. And it wasn't until 2014 that Lloyd Welch was connected to the disappearance of the Lion Sisters. And in that time, he had racked up quite a few um, criminal offenses. He was a registered sex offender. So from the 1970s to the mid-1990s, he had been working as, you know, a traveling carnival worker. So, you know, as he'd go to these different places, he was committing crimes pretty much throughout the country. In 1978, he was charged with burglary in Maryland. Then in South Carolina, he pleaded guilty to grand larceny into molesting a child. It was a 10-year-old girl. In 1997, he was arrested um, in Delaware for a number of unlawful sex charges. In 1998, he pleaded guilty to first-degree unlawful sexual intercourse. And then in 2017, he finally pleaded guilty to murder, first-degree murder of the Lion Sisters. Now, authorities had found um, some charred remains and a tooth. Um, on a relative of Lloyd Welch's property, and they believe that that belonged to the Lion Sisters. Um, he had also been seen with them prior. So once Georgianne saw that Lloyd had been arrested, she actually sent him letters and went to visit him in prison because she was trying to get him to confess to the Raker Sisters' murder. She thought there were just too many similarities, you know, that he had been in the town, um, that he had a knife, that he raped her in exactly the same place where the girls had been murdered, but he would not confess to anything. And despite all the similarities, law enforcement never considered him a suspect in the case of the Raker sisters. So you can let me know, you know, what you think about that. Was he possibly responsible for the Raker sisters' murder um, or not. So then we are going to talk about the man um, that the authorities and the girl's family believe was responsible um, for their murder. There has never been enough evidence to get a conviction in this case. There's never been enough solid physical evidence and law enforcement received a lot of criticism for that. In 1997, they actually uh, fired or took the lead investigator off the case and replaced him because one of uh, the problems was that they never drained the quarry. So that's where Mary's body was found. They never drained the water to see what other evidence they could find. Um, so they never found the murder weapon and that could have you know, helped get them some physical evidence. And this man, the original investigator, I'm not going to say his name. Um, he has, I believe, passed away since. But he actually kept evidence, even though he was taken off the case. He kept evidence, and they didn't discover that evidence until the 80s when um, he he actually passed away and then they were going through his office and they found that evidence. Um, so, but in the, in the meantime, since that, there have been, um, more investigations. They did look for DNA on the girl's clothing. Um, they didn't find any good information from that. Unfortunately, um, in 2007, there was this organization called VidDoc, and they're a group of investigators, like from different backgrounds. And so the investigators in the Raker case sent their case files over, and this was in 2007. And these professionals agreed with the investigators with who they thought was responsible. 
So when the family heard that, you know, even though they had all these concerns about the case not being um, handled correctly, they were at least happy to see that these professionals thought that law enforcement was on the right track with who was responsible. Okay, so now let's talk about who Mary and Suzanne's family and the authorities thought was responsible. And that was a man named Herbert Notch. In 1976, so this was two years after the girls were murdered, 18-year-old Herbert Notch and 17-year-old James Wagner were charged with six felony counts for robbery, kidnapping, sexual assault, and the stabbing of a girl. On September 25th, 1976, the two decided to rob the dairy bar. James was carrying a 22 caliber pistol. He showed it to the 14-year-old girl who was working, and he asked her to give um, him all the money. So she gave the money, and then he left the store. Um, Herbert then followed James out, bringing the girl with him at gunpoint. They made the girl get into the car and sit between them. Herbert was driving, and he told her that he would kill her if she didn't stay quiet and do what they told her to do. He drove to a gravel pit, which was east of Luxembourg, Minnesota. And once there, James said he saw Herbert cut her sweater. Okay, so remember that Mary Raker's sweater was also cut. Then he cut off her bra and her underwear. And remember, Mary's bra was also cut and her underwear were up on the cliff. Herbert then raped her and then he stabbed her twice. The two men then kind of put her under some bushes and she stayed quiet. She pretended like she was unconscious and whenever they left, then she actually got up and went to go get help. So at that point, Herbert was convicted and he was in jail for 10 years. Um, however, once he was released, it didn't take long for him to get in trouble again. In 1988, he was convicted of burglary and false imprisonment, um, but there were also rape charges, but the jury didn't come to a decision on that. Um, in 1991, he offered to drive a 27-year-old woman home from Tom's Bar in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Instead of driving her home, he took her to a rural area where he molested her and told her, shut up or I'll kill you. He was charged with second degree sexual criminal conduct and attempted first degree sexual conduct, criminal sexual conduct. He was arrested for that charge in 1993 after two years on the run, but he ended up being acquitted for those last charges. Even though law enforcement never publicly released his name as a suspect, and I'm guessing that's because they didn't have uh, enough physical evidence that they said that they were constantly monitoring the situation of this person to see if maybe there was a breakup, like maybe his wife would leave him and then maybe she'd be willing to give information or to see if somebody got terminally ill or something like that where they might be willing to make a confession. So law enforcement kept an eye on this. Then in 2017, Rita... So remember, that's the girl's mother. Rita got a tip from someone that Herbert was in the hospital and that he was dying of liver failure after many years of heavy drinking. Uh, so when she heard this, she and one of her sons went to the hospital. She just had to see him. She wanted to talk to him for him herself to see if you know, looking him in the eyes, she could get him to give any information about what had happened um, to her daughters. At this point, Rita was 82 years old and Herbert was 58. So you can imagine this 82-year-old woman going into the hospital uh, to confront this man. She spoke with him for 20 minutes she said, I'm the mother of Mary and Suzanne Raker, and I've waited 42 years for this. I need some answers. And he pointed at her and said, I give you my word, I didn't do this. He also said, why can't you just put it behind you? And she said, because they are my children, and as long as I'm alive, I'm going to be searching for their killer. 
She also told him, you know, you've got days left. You can make your peace with God before you die. And he said, I'm going to hell and I don't do church. And after that, he really, he got angry with her and he said, you're starting to piss me off. So after that visit, um, two weeks after that visit, he died at the age of 58 from liver failure. Rita said that after looking into the eyes of who she believed to be her daughter's killer, she found peace. She wanted to see who her daughters had faced in the last moments of their lives. She felt there was nothing left of him to be fearful of. So now you have him, he's dying, and she just wanted to look in her, his eyes. Um, he didn't give her any answers, but, you know, she said that she found peace. The girl's father, Fred Raker, he passed away on December 31st, 2012, at the age of 84. He and his wife, Rita, had been married for over 50 years. Um, and as I've last seen, Rita um, is still living, and she's in her 80s. Um, so anyone with information on the Raker case is asked to call the Stearns County Sheriff's Department at 320-251-4240. Um, tipsters can remain anonymous, and they also may be eligible for a reward. Um, so if you know anything, even if you think it's insignificant, um, please call the number um, that I provided. Um, so what do you think in this case? Do you think that Lloyd Welch was, was responsible? We know that he was in the area uh, at the time because of the carnival being there, because he raped Georgianne, and because he, you know, used a knife that was similar to the Raker sister's murder. Um, he was also responsible for going on and murdering two sisters and for a wealth of sexual crimes throughout the country. So he's the one uh, potential suspect. The other one um, was Herbert Notch. And Herbert Notch is who authorities and the family again feel is responsible. And I do think that um, likely it was Herbert Notch um, it is a shame that he was never convicted, uh, but, you know, he did die fairly early at the age of 58 uh, from liver failure. I think if anything um, positive can come out of this, it is that Rita, the girl's mother, was able to find some peace. Um, she, I'm just you know, really impressed with her that she's 82 years old. And at 82 years old, she went to see this killer, even though he was in the hospital, you know, and dying, she still wanted to go and look him in the eyes and confront him for having murdered her children. And I think that that just takes, you know, so much strength and it really says something about her character and her love for those girls. And even though they did not get legal justice like Mary had hoped for in her diary entry, you know, and we don't know if she actually knew um, that somebody was targeting her. Um, all her family members have said that they don't really... You know, she didn't have any enemies. She didn't, if she was fearful for her life, she didn't confide in them, um, which was strange because, you know, she was close with her family and close with her siblings. Um, so they don't know if that was just something she said or if, you know, she had been threatened. And Herbert Notch was from the area. You know, he was a local. Uh, he knew the quarry. So it is possible that they had had interactions. Um, I do think that Herbert Notch is the most likely suspect here. And again, I am happy that the mother was able to confront him and find her peace. So if you um, enjoy hearing about true crime stories and missing person cases, please subscribe to my channel and I will see you in the next video.
Bye.